Every life has a story, and every story is worth sharing. Your story, my story, and our story speak of victory and defeat, joy and sorrow, resilience and vulnerability. They are not just our story, they are Christ's story in us. They are Kingdom Stories from Down Under. Welcome to Kingdom Stories from Down Under. Tonight with me in the studio, we have uh, Linda Goldsmith. Linda is a mum, a wife, and a missionary. A missionary to Africa uh, to look after children and to support families out of poverty. She lives in Australia and she is the CEO and founder of uh, Access Hope Incorporated. Um, it's a privilege to have Linda with us here tonight and I can't wait to hear a story. Welcome Linda. Thank you so much. There's so much packed in your life. I can't, I can't wait to unpack it. Great. I can't Where wait Where do to we start? <laughs> <laughs> you can't wait to hear your own story, right? No, I can't wait to share it. Well, yes, and hear my own story again. <laughs> so it started here in Perth? It started here in Perth. Born in Perth. In Leaderville it started. <laughs> wow, that's a good, good place. Yes. I love Leaderville. So. Near Lake Monga. I was, um, yeah, in Loftus Street. What yes. number? Hmm, 112 I think it was, something No like way. You know, I owned 114 Loftus Street for a number of years. I lived at 114 Loftus Street. I'm sure it wasn't when I was born though. No, no, no. <laughs> a it's bit. around there. We can pass the other day and it's a big wow. two-story place. So, yeah, wherever right. that big two-story place is, that's where I was. <laughs> I know exactly the house because it was wow. next door to me. Wow, so it really was. Wow. What a small world. Oh, that I bought that so in uh, 1997, 98, I think. Mm -hmm. I had it for a few years and I lived there. Wow. Wow, I love the street. There you go. Small world. <laughs> Oh, that's a good start. Yeah, that's a very good start. <laughs> See, we, we, we've got more connections than we realise. We do. So, yeah. mum and dad? Well, mum and dad were great parents. And uh, when I was about two and a half, we moved to Woodlands. Okay. And I uh, got a brother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, three years younger than me. and. Um, so, you probably don't remember little of that at all? No, not at all. Okay. Not any of the stories I've heard, but no, I don't. Um, but I thank God for my parents because a lot of who they are is who I am, of course, yes. and the fact that they were Christian and they brought me up to, to go to church and where I found a love for the Lord. So, so they were um, born again Christians? Yes, yes. What church did you go to? Um, Wimney they... Downs Baptist we went okay. to. Yes. Nice. That was so... a prominent church in the 70s. Mm, it was. So... So yeah, from Woodlands to Wembley Downs is not that far. No, not that far. Just a couple of hills. <laughs> That's it. That's beautiful. So is it just the two of you? Yes, well I actually had a sister come along when I was 12, so there's a bit of a gap between us. Okay. Um, so there was the three so of us. Mm. And you grew up around uh, Lake Jakarta? Yes, I did actually. Mm. That's when my husband proposed to me. Am I wow. allowed to tell those stories too? <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> what was your dad doing? What was he working? Um, oh, Dad did a few jobs, but he was in car sales and mm -hmm. also real estate okay. too. So, yeah. And Mum? And Mum, um, she was, well, she was a home mum, but she was also, uh, at one stage, she was working as secretary as well. And, uh, yeah, so they're great. Nice. They, they worked hard for us to put us through a good education and um, went to private schools did you? We did, my brother and I actually and my sister as well we went to, I went to St Mary's and mm -hmm. went to Christchurch Wow. and Carol and Christchurch and so um, I think I feel very privileged anyway, I'm very thankful and very privileged. Yeah. Yeah. What do you remember of childhood? What do I remember of childhood? Okay, um, I remember going to the Claremont showgrounds during the holidays and they had these little cars and you could race around in these cars. Yeah. And my brother and I did that. That's something I really remember. It must have been such a fun day that yeah. <laughs> that came to mind remember. straight away. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember going to the Baptist church. I remember being in the Steadfords and being, um, uh, you know, involved in activities, the youth group there and yeah. How were your teenage years? Oh, teenage years. Um, well, 
pretty civilised, I think, yeah. <laughs> compared to you some. You didn't stretch the boundaries? No, I didn't stretch the boundaries. It was actually when I was about 14 that my parents were um, introduced to a Pentecostal church called Shiloh. Mm -hmm. Faith Centre. I know that sounds like a funny name, Faith Centre, but it was actually very sound and a wonderful church. It was the biggest church in Perth at that stage. And it was there that I really, um, well, was born again as we know it. During my childhood, I loved the so Lord. So your parents came to Shiloh from? My parents did. They were invited by somebody in the Baptist church yes. and we all went over to Shiloh. Um, but my parents didn't stay there. They ended up going to another church, but I stayed. I got involved in the youth group. Yeah. I was just at the right age. Unfortunately, my brother, he was too old for the younger one and too young for the older one. Oh. He didn't actually fit, uh, um, which was a real shame, but I did. I yeah. got into the youth group and really connected, and um, and that's where I got really born again as we know it, at 14. At, yes, and 15 water baptised, and, and that, those times... Like that little times, pool inside of the stage there? Yes, the fall under and... Oh, nice. <laughs> um, John Fingelli? Yes, he was there, Frank Holtgren, yeah, and, and John, and um, it was wonderful, actually, that... It was a good church. It was fantastic. It was a great church, and even today, I have to admit, Sorry if my pastor sees this, <laughs> but I've never felt so so close and in a church as I was in Shiloh. Wow. Yeah, but maybe all these significant things happened anyway. You yeah. know, I got born again, I got spirit filled, I got water baptized. Plus, it was the husband. period. Oh, you met your husband. Yes. Plus, it was the period of history when your mm. emotional sort of charge would be the highest. So you mm. lived every moment. Mm. On a, Mm. Wonderful child. Yes, kind of thing. so that was really great because that really kept me through those teenage years that can be very rocky. Yeah, and difficult. so you didn't have that. No, I didn't have that. I mean, I mean you know, of good, course, good, good I. Good youth leaders, good youth Well, that's coach. right, yeah. And also, I think I just had that really strong Christian conviction that, you know, of what was right and what was wrong, yeah. what I could do and what I couldn't yeah. do. I mean, I, of course, nobody's perfect, are they? But, you know, um, yeah, I think I was. I got through that. So, what about <laughs> this? So, we're talking about Leaderville, 112, 114. This, oh, is, yeah. this is how close this is, right? Okay. You know, we bought Shiloh. The no, the I. The Pentecostal Church, which I was part of, we bought Shiloh, and I inherited John F. Kelly's office. Oh, oh, that, you must have been so blessed. <laughs> so John, that's a fun for you. <laughs> I, and this is just unbelievable. Wow. So when, Sh when Shiloh became a C3 and they moved to Heaven Heights, oh, the we, we bought that church and wow. I, I was the youth leader there and the music director oh. and uh, I inherited that office where John Finkelty left the anointing. <laughs> well, there you go. So another strong wow. Right? wow. Long oh. before the Australian ministry and wow. uh, you know, the other connections that wow. we have. Yeah, Shiloh, but, I just feel so privileged. You know, I feel a lot of people don't get that today you yeah. know what it was like back then was just awesome and um let's believe that there'll be a shake up in the churches and some of the things that happened then will happen today as well yeah. we well it, it will happen in a different way but mm. uh in a similar way but in a different way mm. you know for this generation i mm. think which is wonderful mm. wonderful there you go well, I wonder what other connections we so have as we go where did you meet here I met him as church, actually. Nice, nice. Yes. I was waiting for that. Yes. That's yes. right. He, yes, he said that he saw me walking down the aisle. How's that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the aisle before walking down the aisle. Yes. <laughs> and, um, yeah, he, yeah, he knew. He knew right from the word go that I was the one. It was like the Lord had said to him, yeah. that's your wife. But mind you, I how didn't did, know for how, about four years. How did he approach you? <laughs> um... Well, it was interesting because I was having my 17th birthday mm -hmm. and I was inviting all my friends from Shiloh to come along and he just happened to be there. That's convenient, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so he just happened to be there and I invited him along. I had, He's a little bit older than me, so I hadn't really... We weren't in the same youth groups. Yes. He was in with Jonathan Keldy and I yeah. was in the younger one. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I just, you know said, would you like to come along too? And 
um, he turned out that he lived in the next suburb to me. So he was in Wembley Downs. Yep. And I was wanting what well, I was learning to drive. Oh. And very conveniently, he offered to, you know. Teach you how to drive. Yeah, well, yes, that's right. Teach me how to drive and to, to take him out to Shiloh. So the church, so that's what we did. So um, Sunday morning and Sunday evening. You were we very good back then, weren't we? We went to two services. Well, you're a pastor, so you have to use. Okay. <laughs> we, we still have two services in our church. <laughs> yeah. And um, so that's what happened. Yeah. And then I remember one time we got to church and he had to race in because he was on the door. And it was like my eyes just opened and I thought, oh, he's not bad. Oh. <laughs> so that's when it all started, of course. But, but um, he, he had you, but, but he already you, knew. Didn't, you didn't get no, it yet. No, no. Bit of a, maybe a dark block back there. No. <laughs> no. Sorry, and, scrap that. And, and Jack had it, yeah? Well, that's, yes, he actually he proposed. he proposed to me at Jack had a lake, yeah. Wow. So we actually went out for four years. How's that? Mm. Yes, and he was prepared to wait for me for seven more years. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if it was needed. Well, you know, the Bible story yeah. says. <laughs> um, but he asked me and I said, well, I'll tell you in a week's time. Yeah. Is that naughty to do that a whole week? <laughs> it, I, it would be on today's. Yes, uh, but you know what? I was one of those girls. That was a big decision for me, seriously. Oh, massive. And um, for me, it was a life commitment. So I really, even though we'd been going out for four years, I really, really wanted to make sure 100% that that was what I was meant to do. Wow. And I knew there was something different about it. How old were you, 21, 22? Uh, 20, yes, 21. And mm -hmm. he was? Uh, 28. Mm. That's not a big No, 28. 29, must have been, he's eight yeah. years older. Mm. It's mm. like my wife at night, nine mm. years. So mm. It's mm. normal. It's yeah. normal, again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So then I asked my boss, and uh, he wasn't particularly helpful. He said, well, you can either have your holidays in three months' time or wait till the following year. And I thought, man, we've been going out for four years already. We'll just really, you know, make this work. And so well, three months later, we were married. Nice. And, uh, and you walked down the aisle at Shiloh. That's right. I walked down Back the aisle Back in the days at Shiloh. when, when uh, churches still were open to have weddings inside. Yes. And it's we didn't like, have to pay. <laughs> it's like nowadays, they don't oh, want it. I don't gosh. know what's going wrong. I know. My girlfriend, um, last year she got married in a park because the church that she's a member of was going to charge her and she just thought, oh, well. Well, mm. that's mm. strange. It's a bit sad, isn't it, really? Yeah. Mm. But anyway, yeah, that's, that's it. And that's then you had, was. so you met Ian and uh, you remained in church, hopefully. Yes, yes, we did. <laughs> were, were you doing any ministry? Um, yes, I, I was a singer mm -hmm. and I, um, I was always singing, playing the guitar, singing all sorts so, of places. So you learned music place. when yes, you were a teenager? Well, I learned the piano as a child and I learned the organ, went back and learned the organ as an adult, mm -hmm. but I learned the guitar in between there as well. And that was the thing that I mostly used, yeah. um, was backing myself with the guitar. But sometimes I just sang with band backups, you know, weddings and yeah, engagements yeah. and birthdays and different things like that. But um, everybody that knew me back then knew that I was singing and playing the guitar. Nice. Um, but then they started shallow dances and I remember hearing about that and I didn't get invited to join and my heart was just going, oh, oh boy, I just, there was something about it that really drew me yes. to that. And I remember going over to my friend's house, Pauline, I don't know if you know her, Pauline Jenkins. I know the name, I don't know. Okay, well anyway, she was running the group and we were talking and then she said, oh, Vindra, what about you joining the group? And it was like, oh, oh yes. I've been waiting for this. Yeah. And so it was wonderful and that was my first introduction into Christian dance. Mm -hmm. And I'd actually been going to um, Gilkinson's just doing secular dancing and I loved it. And I danced from the moment then I got there to the moment I left and somebody at Shiloh said to me, Linda, is that really the best thing you should be doing, you know, yeah. because of the people you're associating with and, um, you know, I know there's lots of lovely people that go dancing but also at that age you're vulnerable too and you can maybe mix with the wrong people 
And so I thought, no, I, I can't continue with this. So I gave it up. And I remember that was something that was really hard to do. Yeah. And, you know, looking back, just God's amazing. You know that. And, you know, I gave that up for him. And yet he blessed me with the Christian dance. Wow. And, uh, you know, the best dance you could ever do. Yeah. And that's actually, I know we'll come to it later, but that's what God used to get me to the mission field. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. So, yeah. So you had your couple of kids? Yes, well... What were you doing as a career? So when you finished school, what did you do? You okay, went? well, I ended up working my way up. I was a receptionist and then I worked my way up to being a secretary for a group commercial management. Yes. A manager and the finance and administration for Barrett Mine Management, so a mining company. And um, Ian? Pardon? And Ian? Oh, Ian was working um, for the city of Perth and then in a clerical position. And just after we got married, he was riding his motorbike home and he thought to himself, you know, he got into teaching after he finished school, yes. but he didn't want to study again. He just started working. He was then at the railway, as they called it back then, and, and he just got his first pay. He thought, oh, do I want to have to go and study again? Um, but this time, after we got married, he realised that he ever did, wanted to do teaching, it was now or never. It was going to be so yeah. much harder if you had a child. So he did a great deal. So I actually ended up putting him through teachers training college. So I worked, um, but I was in a good job, so we could afford for me to do that. And he and, went to churchlands. And he went to churchlands. In actual fact, my mum was studying teaching, and she said to Ian, please don't call out across the campus, hi mum. <laughs> oh, that's cute. <laughs> yeah. Now you wouldn't believe this. Okay, tell me. Ronald and I both have studied at Church Friends at the Inthgang University. Oh, wow. And then when they demolished the university, we built our house there and we live on campus. You live on campus? We live where the university used to be, at Church Friends. Wow, I know the spot, wow. <laughs> wow. Small world, eh? Mm. We've trotted the same parts many times. Wow, that's amazing. This is nice crazy. Spot. Yeah, nice but I mean, place. you got to understand, Loftus Street, mm. uh, Shiloh, mm. uh, <laughs> Church Lens Green. Well, yeah. we haven't finished yet. <laughs> we haven't finished yet, yeah. <laughs> so there might be another one. So, yeah. wow. So then Ian got um, a posting to Chewett Hill mm -hmm. for six months, and then he got sent to the country oh. to do our country service. And I remember thinking, oh, I don't want to go, my life's going to end, and... You know, that, that's what I yeah, thought as a first, young as a, first a, blow. a young wife. I just thought, oh no. Where was it? Uh, well, we got posted to Lehman. We got, actually got posted to Jury and then they rang us straight back and said, Lehman. We said, Lehman, where's Lehman? There was no Google Maps back then. No, it's a bit further Atlas. on from. <laughs> yeah. it's a, of the a bit further on from Durian. But you know what? It was amazing. In lots of ways, our yeah. life just began. Because we found out, as much as we love Shiloh, as I've expressed already, we were in a bit of a rut. You know, we'd been there for years. Yeah. And it was just, it was, it was challenging. But too comfortable at the same time. Pardon? Too comfortable at the same time. Yes, yes. Oh, it was comfortable at Shiloh. But I'm saying when we went to Lena, yeah. it was challenging. Challenge. And there was times where I felt very dry spiritually and it was very hard going because so we went to a place that had, was the same size of the church, about <laughs> 500 people. <laughs> the whole town. Yeah, when we went to visit it, we went up on the weekend, it was a three hour drive, went up yeah. to just have a look, and we met somebody on the jetty, and she said, oh, you're the new teacher and the new teacher's wife, and I'm thinking, you know. what? We haven't even moved in and they know about us yeah. already, and so, yeah, we know what it's like in a small country town. <laughs> That's cute. But yeah, it was that was. It was a massive opportunity to minister there. Well, it was. It was. Because you knew all the parents, everybody knew you, so you you had a captive yeah. audience in a sense. We did. And was I, there a church? Um. Not really. Uh, that I can remember at that time, we had like a home fellowship. Mm -hmm. There was a home fellowship somewhere else, and we had one at our house as well. Yeah. Um, when it wasn't there, it was at our house. I think that's how it worked anyway. Um, we had a guy, Trevor Patterson, do you remember him? He's passed away, but his wife was Isabel. And he came up and he'd do a run. 
he'd do a run at some country places and then he'd come up to Lehman and do a Bible study at our house. Yeah. Um, yes, we used to go to Badgingera oh. for church. So we'd oh, drive, it was about, yeah. yes, to get to church on a Sunday night and go back. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, there were some beautiful Christians and did up there. did you find work as well in, in, in Lehman? Um, well, I ended up teaching music. So oh, right. I ended up teaching the piano okay. and uh, the organ. So actually, no, I think I was teaching the organ then. Oh, I have to think right back. Yeah. Um, at that time, so I ended up teaching 24 years all up. Nice. Um, but it started in Lehman, which was great. Yeah. But talking about ministry up there, just in some simple ways. I mean, I ran... A Sunday school up there, and so I did a um, a musical for the yeah. town, and that would have really blown them away, you know, yeah. when when the Lord's name is glorified and, yeah. and all. But it was good. Um, but Ian would have he'd invite some of the children over. Well, actually, what he did when he started teaching up at Lehman, he said, "If anybody would like to come over, any of the kids you'd like to come over, you're welcome." Mm -hmm. And so they did. And I remember I prepared all these sandwiches for all these little children. We're sitting around and. And I said, oh, now let's say grace. And they go, grace? <laughs> yeah, and so it's really interesting. And, and, that, and one other little boy, he would come over quite a lot. And I thought, I've got to utilise this time wisely with him yeah. than just giving him some afternoon tea and just general chat. And so I ended up, you know, ministering, really, yeah, ministering to this little boy. And who knows? It's hopefully that he's, he's a Christian today and maybe doing the same thing. So How yes, long? there is lots of opportunities in these places. How long were you in Lehman? In five years okay. in Lehman. And your kids were born there or here before? Um, well, I had Grace okay. uh, in, in Lehman. In yeah, Tess? Amazing Grace. Um, and then we chose to adopt. Oh. And we were up in Geraldton. We got transferred to Geraldton. Mm -hmm. And uh, we adopted Tess from South Korea. Yeah. And she was here? She was here? Tess was here. Or she was in South Korea, were you sponsoring her? No, we, no she, we adopted her through the government at that oh, time, here okay. through Perth. And uh, we went over to South Korea and brought her over. What was her situation? Where were her parents? Um, well, her parents were very young when they got married and they got divorced. And, you know, it's a different situation over there back then yeah, anyway. We the mentality, long time ago. the perspective. Um, you know... Oh, Shame. And yes. Many. And a, a woman with a child, very unlikely they'd get married again back then. I don't know, yeah. it could be different now. Um, back then, a lot of women didn't even tell their parents or anybody. They'd just go off somewhere and have the babies and come back. But, um, yeah, so when they, they divorced, the mum had to go off to work, so she left tests with her parents. Yes. This is what we think happened anyway. Yeah. It's like puzzle yeah. pieces that you put together with adoption sometimes. Um, we found out that the grandmother was seriously ill, mm -hmm. so we think that maybe she might have passed away and then it was too much for the grandfather. Okay. So we ended up adopting Tess, yeah. Was it a simple process or very difficult? No, it was <laughs> extremely difficult. Even back then? Even back then. This is the uh, late 70s, early 80s? Um, this is... Late 80s? Yes, yes, that would be right probably. Um, well, we adopted her in, she was three when we adopted her, and that was in, let me see, she was born in 93, so that would be 96, okay. so it was in the early 90s. Yes. So what happened with adoption too, is that when we wanted to have Grace, our natural born daughter, yes. we, I also wanted Life. to adopt. I think that's, you know, I always say that um, Grace was the seed in my stomach, but Tess was the seed in my heart. Wow. Because my parents sponsored through World Vision when I was a little girl. Yes. And so my brother and I used to write to the children that they sponsored. Then when I started working, I started sponsoring a child. Mm -hmm. And I also uh, did some volunteer work with World Vision, so ran a World Vision fundraising group. Yeah. And so I think all those things led up to me wanting to adopt a child. Yes. And I thank God I had a husband that supported yeah, me with that. Open, it was open, he was great with that too. Wow. Which would have made it very difficult if he wasn't, but he yeah. was very willing to do that. 
and like me. And bringing somebody from overseas with yes. you know costs and, and the, language the, barrier. The money involved. Yeah. You know, it's a very, very expensive process. It was long. then and I imagine it is today. Yeah. And very long too, because we had Grace, they cancelled our application, we had to reapply. Mm. And I was actually just telling somebody today that I remember through a time where I was so kind of cross, you know, we weren't moving forward and I was really cross and wanted to speak to somebody in the department um, and God told me through a scripture to be silent. Yes. And I didn't say anything and the Lord just intervened. Wow. And then after that, we had a significant move forward yep. and not long after that, we managed to find out about Tess and adopt her. Wow. So there's times to speak, isn't there? And there's times to be silent and to That's be quiet. Right. And yeah, so... So she came to Geraldton? She came to Geraldton. She came to Geraldton, that's right. And, and there was no language you can communicate No, with. in actual fact, when we first brought her out... Um, did you go there to pick her up? We did. Both of us went over there to pick, pick her up. We could have sent somebody over, a yeah. welfare uh, worker. worker and but we wanted to go and get her and get her ourselves and it was wonderful. We saw her a couple of times. I think it was the third time we managed to bring her out, saw her a couple yeah. of times. We took her for ice cream when we were over there. I don't think she'd had it before, but she loved it, like most kids and some adults. Yes, <laughs> um, me included. Yeah, me. Love our ice cream. Um, but when we got her back to Australia, the next morning she was chatting away when we brought her up to our home in Geraldton. She was chatting away and I thought, oh, you know, what she's saying is something wrong. So I managed to get an interpreter on the phone. Yeah. It probably cost us an arm and a leg back then to do that. But we found out that she wanted ice cream for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> she loved it so much, so yeah. she wanted the ice cream. Um, yeah. So what a scallywag it went, okay? Within a few weeks, you could come Well, it was it. actually Grace. I have to put it down to Grace, our daughter. Even though there's just a year between them, so yeah. Grace was four and Tess was almost three. Um, mind you, her first words were "hungry jacks." Yeah. That's the power of the television, the media. Yeah. But Grace, because they were so you know close in age, they were playing together, going to bed at the same yeah. time, every doing everything together, and it was really it's Grace sisters. that uh, taught her to speak English. I yeah. believe we just fine tuned a few things. Yeah. Um, yeah, so That's, yeah. It's, it was a lovely time and, yeah. you know, you miss those times. Yeah. Well, I do anyway, yeah. As a That's mum. beautiful. Mm. Beautiful. Mm. And what brought you back to Perth? All right, what brought us back to Perth? Well, um, we just felt that that's what God wanted us to do, was to come back to Perth. How long were you in Geraldton? We were in Geraldton for 13 years, so we were in the country right. for 18 years all up. Um, so I ended up running a dance group in Geraldton as nice. well, started a dance group, Christian dance group and movement group there. Yeah. The first one they'd had as far as I know. And um, yeah, the girls were going into high school. We just felt it was the right time. It was just time for us to come back. Mm. And Ian got a teaching position, so the doors just opened up. It just made sense. It made sense, just as the Lord does. He closes doors and opens doors, and we had all these doors open for us to come, come down. And, and what did, introduced you to mission? Or okay, who? what introduced me to mission? So when you came back, did you come back to Australia or C3? Or? Uh, no, we didn't actually. We, um, I'd been the tour manager for ABC Tokyo, a Japanese ballet company. Okay. And my friends down here, the Mills, Ivan and Jane Mills, I'm not sure if you know them or not, uh, lovely people, dear friends, um, we managed to get Oh, I managed to get the ballet company to do a performance at the church, and that church that they went to was very involved in missions. Mm -hmm. um, so when we came down also, we ended up staying with the mills for a number of months while we found a house. And um, yeah, so I think that's why we actually got connected with the church that we go to now, is through the mills and yeah, the ballet company. All that. <laughs> Just that it together yeah, nicely. Yeah, kind of blended. Um, hmm. So what was the first mission trip away? Okay. Well, the first missions trip, there's something I've got to say leading into that actually, sure. is that 
we decided just after about six months after we got Tess, I think it was something like that or a year later, we decided to, Ian had um, six months off school, so he had three months long service and you could get on a half day Double. and go around, yeah. which was just wonderful experience. So we went around Australia in a caravan. Oh. Most tremendous time. I'd recommend that to anybody. And We'd love to do that once. You've got to do it. You really, there's so many opportunities. Or twice. Yes. Go home school the kids. Yeah, well, we went for almost seven months. So mm -hmm. um, the school holidays is yeah. included as well. But there's so many opportunities to minister to people as you travel around Australia. It's just mm -hmm. incredible. If you're open to that, you can just be doing it all the time. So we went around Australia. And when I came back, I was in a crossroads in my life. I offered to do some um, office assistant work at the local school where Ian was teaching, Mount yep. Tarkorda. That was actually in Geraldton, um, still before we came down. And But I didn't want to have another baby just for the sake of having a baby. But I didn't know what I was meant to do. And I remember I had this heart to heart with God. Now, I don't have this kind of thing all the time, just to you know, occasionally you might, but I was pacing up and down, really saying to God, because I'd listened to this cassette tape that yes. showed my age, isn't it? Cassette tape. <laughs> and <laughs> <Walkman>. it was <laughs> on the walkman. And it was about this guy and he went to China. Yeah. And when I listened to it, not that I had a heart for China necessarily, but when I listened to it, it was something just birthed within me and I just got excited and I said to God, God, you know I want to serve you. You know I want to go to missions. You know, you know this is what I want to do. Yes. And anyway, Ivan Mills had come up to Ger to Geraldton, and I bumped into him. I wasn't, I didn't know he'd come, but I bumped into him, and I invited him over. And he was saying to me that um, he was going on a missions trip, and that the person who was leading the singing was sick and couldn't go. Could I come and take my guitar? Yeah. And we didn't have any money, and I borrowed off my dad. <laughs> yeah, back then you did anything. You know, I did anything for missions trips, you know, trying yeah. to get money anywhere, any which way. And um, anyway, so Dad was gracious enough to uh, lend it to us. And I think it was around a week later I was on the plane. Or, yeah. So it was a couple of weeks from that heart to heart with God. And at that time I thought to me, myself I should say, that has to be when the girls are older, I'm retired. Yeah. I would never have thought in my wildest dreams that I'd ever go onto the mission field then. Mm. Never. But that's what God wanted. And so a couple of weeks after that heart to heart and seeing Ivan was when I was on the plane going to the Philippines. And that trip... That was your first mission. That was my first... Well, Korea, really. South Korea was the first one, but this one was more... Yes. In a different way. We were focused on, on evangelism and that. So Which part of the uh, Philippines? I went to Legaspi. Okay. Mm. Is that out of out of Manila. Okay. So it's about a, an hour's plane flight or so. Mm. And that trip changed my life forever. Praise God. <laughs> yes. Best year for the good. <laughs> for the for the good, yeah. yeah. For, for positively changed my life. <laughs> Yeah, and I just came back and all I could think about was was missions and the trip and yeah. I'd be hanging up the washing and, you know, I loved my husband and I still love my husband and I love my children, but I was thinking, what am I doing here? I, I just wanted to be there and just yeah. be serving the Lord. It was it was so difficult yeah. in that I felt pulled. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that was the first trip and a lot happened from that. I was asked if I would... Um, find a, some sponsorship for a couple of girls so they could go to school. Yep. And I just thought, Lord, how do I do this? You know, I, I'd never done anything like that before. And I was playing badminton. Ah. You play badminton? Yeah, great sport. Ah, there you go. There's another one. <laughs> yeah, I don't play it enough. I love the sport. Yeah, I love it too. I've been playing for donkey's years now. Mm. But I went to Batty and this lady, we're in the kitchen. I was just about to get a drink. And this is absolutely God. You know, I've seen God just do things in my life over yeah. and over again. She said to me, I'm thinking of sponsoring. Oh. I'm thinking, what? <laughs> so I said to her, Harriet, I've just been to the Philippines and I was asked if I would organise some sponsorship for these two little children. Wow. And she ended up sponsoring those girls for years. Phenomenal. Yeah, just incredible. 
lovely lady, God bless her. And um, that the father of those girls had TB. His wife had left him. Yes. He was so poor that he'd actually sold his his shoes. Wow. Probably for medication or yes. food. Um, yeah. So the pastor in the Philippines and his his wife that I met on that first trip and became quite well very close to really. They ended up being guardians for those children in the end when he actually, the TB, had already done so much damage he passed away. So that was my first introduction into missions. Yeah. And so... So the bug was inside you now? Big time. How long before your next trip? Uh, probably the next year. I <laughs> doesn't take much, does it? It doesn't. Where did you go next? And I have a supportive husband too. And, you know, I have to add that without Ian and his yeah. support, I wouldn't have done what I have done with yes. my life and um, he's a great man. We were looking, or I read um, Purpose Driven Life oh, yeah. Yeah, and um, anyway, I asked him the questions at the start of it and I said, oh, what do you feel your purpose is? Yes. And he said, I believe my purpose is, is to support you in what God's called you to do. Wow. Yeah. I'll never forget that. Yeah. You know, that's amazing for it's a man usually, to say that. It's usually the other way around. It is. It but is. It's, it's normally the yeah. husband going off and the wife supporting, but... Because of his way. own ways. Yeah, that's right. So that started things. And also, Ian was at the school where the girls were. He was teaching at the same school. So, you know, it wasn't terribly difficult for him, except for he, he couldn't do their school. hair. So he had to send the girls up to the neighbour <laughs> to get their hair done. High school? <laughs> uh, primary right. at that stage. Okay. Mm, so then I was only going away. I went with the mills for um, a few a few times before I started taking my own teams. Yes. And, uh, yeah, so I was only going away for two weeks or yeah. maybe three weeks at the longest. Mm -hmm. And because your first priority is always your family, your family always. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that worked out well. And as they got older, of course, and became independent, that was when I was able to go for longer periods of time started going a couple of times a year. And Africa? How did it all work? Oh, Africa. Well, Africa, I actually started, as I mentioned, taking my own teams and I yeah. ended up going to other countries. Mm -hmm. I went to the Philippines a lot and I started doing a buddy school program where um, schools up in, a couple of schools up in Geraldton, one in particular sponsored underprivileged schools in the Philippines. Good. And one ran for 11 years that set up. Um, and yeah, so... Um, then I took these other teams and then I had an email from somebody from Africa mm -hmm. and he asked me if I would come over and bring a team. Well, I didn't know anybody in Africa. I didn't have anybody I could run to and say, hey, you know, by this time we're down in Perth too. And I, uh, I didn't know anybody I could find out information about this person. So I asked him to send me references and just did the best I could to see what this person was like. So I got a team together and we went over to Kenya mm -hmm. in 2010. And it was a great trip. It was... Um, Nairobi or off? No, this was in Kisumu. Mm -hmm. Or just out of Kisumu actually, in one of the little villages. And uh, we were able to give Bibles to the people there and we you know, preached and we yeah. did children's programs and it was just great. Yeah, just a wonderful time. So then, um, yeah, I found out of somebody that was in was a pastor in a slum in Katale in another area, still yeah. out of Nairobi, probably about six hours drive out of north, towards Uganda border mm -hmm. in Katale. And I was invited there. And when I went there to that slum, I was asked if I would help the children and would start a children's home. So I didn't go seeking it, yes. it actually came to me. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting in this tiny little church. Um, it was a room the size of what we've got here, but you can imagine just packed out, children, Eight, adults, and they're all going la 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 and I'm thinking, what am I doing here? You know, it's in a slum. <laughs> right. And you know, not all slums are safe as well. And I didn't know anybody, I was on my own. Oh, you went um, on your own? I went on my own, yeah. 
So just to meet this contact and find out the situation. Well, I'm not altogether on my own, am I? No, no, no. <laughs> but physically, yeah. you appear. So. Yes. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I came home. I talked to my husband about it and we really prayed about it because, you know, we didn't have any money to start up a children's home. This no. is serious. Yeah. I mean, we had a mortgage then. Yeah. We had children at Swan Christian College, so that we had school fees. Yes. There was no finance to do this. But Ian and I prayed about it and we really believed that God wanted us to step out and do it. Mm. And we felt that if God wanted us to do this, that he would provide and that he loved the children even more than what we could. Yeah. And so we decided to go ahead. Mm. And... Um, you know, it wasn't easy. Not everybody thought that was the right decision, of course. Yeah. And probably looking at it naturally, it looked a bit crazy when yeah. you have no funds to do anything. Yeah. But at this time, I was teaching music and I was also working for the federal government as an interviewer for them, part-time both. And um, I was able to take long service leave and really put my heart and soul into it. Unpaid long service leave, it was, you didn't get paid in my casual job for when you, you took holidays. Yes. Um, but I put my heart and soul into setting up the children's home and the pastor that I'd met was there and also someone on our board because I had to get a steering committee and then a board and I'm sure you know all that process. And one of the ladies on the board said to me that her sister in England had always wanted to with her husband go out and well she had this vision actually yep. that she was with dark children African children and it was raining and she was yeah and she just had this vision and anyway so they they were professional people and they ended up going over and working with the pastor setting up the children's home that side as I worked very hard this end yeah. to get the money and to get sponsorship of and the you children had to raise up home. a significant amount of money a lot of money. Because yeah. you had to buy the land as well, didn't you? Well, not at that stage we didn't. We rented a building, well, we rented yep. a duplex, and we had the children in there, the boys in one side, the girls in the other. But it was it was not big enough. Yeah. And uh, so then we had to move to another uh, place, and we rented that place. And so it was a long time before, well, it was a couple of years down the track before we got land and progressed. But I just have to say, you know, with the people watching that, you know, God took nothing and yeah. made something yeah. and you know it was a sacrifice at times and I was thinking as I was pondering about today that you know that young people in particular I think when you're a little bit older yeah. <laughs> you know that you've, you've known there's sacrifices at times when you're called to do things or something that God's called you to mm. But sometimes the sacrifices of going without things, you know, yes. financially and, you know, it was a, a big step of faith to do that. And um, I actually ended up uh, giving my job up with the Bureau of Statistics. And what, what year did you work at the Bureau of Statistics? Um, I gave that up in 16, 2016. Mm, when so did you start? Well, I started when I was there for 16 years. So I started when I got called to missions because I knew it was an expensive... Was it late, 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 late in the 90s? Uh, yes. Yeah, it was around 99. And you worked at the Exchange Plaza? Yes. You wouldn't believe this. I did seven <laughs> years of APS. Oh, really? What department? IT. Oh. I was in tech support. Wow. And then in, uh, well, I was Bureau of Statistics. Yeah, Australian Bureau of Statistics. Hmm. Well, and sorry, in um, the labour force, getting pop uh, monthly population survey. That's what I was doing. Yeah, well, I, I was the lady that rang you if you hung, hung up on me. Yeah. <laughs> I built the interface that you worked on. You know, when the OCR wasn't reading the forms and you had to data entry those forms? You know, oh, that, those yes. screens, those yes. yellow screens that yes. used to come up? I built those for you. Wow. Downstairs on the well, 14th thank you very floor. Much. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, it was 99 that I first went on my missions trip, so it was then. So I started that... working there in 97. I worked for seven years. Mm. I'm sure. We, we would have. Yeah. We would have been, because, yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, and at that start, wow. when I first went to the Bureau too, they called us in at a lot, a lot yeah. the country interviewers, to yeah. come down to Perth. So you would have been there for sure then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. That's Many connection points, mm, much, much more. Mm. Yeah. Yes. So I ended up leaving the Bureau to, to go full time without any income. And so that's why I'm saying that, you know, God will never let us down. That's what I did as well. Never. I left the Bureau to go into the <laughs> there you go. Maybe I should interview you. No, it's, it's just, it's it's almost impossible to have wow. so many crossroads. Wow, wow. Yeah. So I had something happen to me in 2015 when I was in Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was there and I had a team come over. My husband led a team over. I was already there. But the whole time I wasn't feeling well. Mm -hmm. And Rose, our home director's wife, reminded me of that. Uh, a few years ago, she said, oh, you're always saying that you weren't feeling that well that trip. So the team was wonderful. They were lovely people, really yeah. mature people. So I knew that I could send them out to one of the slums without me having to go. It's the first time and I think the only time I've ever gone without. Yes. You well, know, they've gone without you. They've gone without me. Yes, that's right. And I was just not feeling so good. Anyhow, the team went back and I was meant to meet some people in town, which I did go to, but I can't really remember that very well now. But the next morning I was meant to be giving an encouraging message, just a short encouraging message to a church, and I prepared it all. But um, James's wife, Rose, came in and she said, oh, how come you're not up, Mum? What's going on? Yes. Because I'm always excited about getting up for church, you know? I'm always up early, get ready and all that type of thing. And I remember putting my hands on my head and saying, I just don't feel like I can cope. And she said, I think we should take you to hospital, which is what happened. And uh, so I went to the hospital. Yeah. I came back and normally there's hugs and cuddles and everything from all the children, but there was none of that. I just went inside and I remember going from the car, getting out of the car to go inside. They must have. And that's all I can remember. And what happened is apparently I went to bed and I just said I wanted to go to sleep. And that was unusual for me because I don't sleep during the day. But I became unconscious and I was unconscious for almost five days. Mm -hmm. mm. And what happened was I had an ear infection and it had gone up my mastoid into my brain and became a brain infection. Ooh. And I got what's called cerebritis. Mm. which is like meningitis yeah. and at first they didn't know what it was but then the next day when I didn't wake up because they always think it's malaria and typhoid every, every time you think it's malaria and typhoid um, but the next day when I didn't wake up and we were actually going to be heading off uh, into a interior area and looking back I'm just so thankful that that didn't, didn't happen die. because I probably wouldn't be here today well um, we spoke to a Kenyan doctor when I came back and he said that uh, pretty much almost all people die from that, yes. even in Australia, yeah. and I'm in rural Kenya. Um, so it was amazing that in Kenya at that time they only had two MRI machines, yes. and I think they're seconds from America or something like that, and one was in Katale, oh, and I so that. I had this MRI so machine. Did a scan. They did a scan. So then I was sent down to Nairobi by plane, Mm -hmm. and, um, and then woke up, no, I wasn't, and then I woke up down there and, yeah, in hospital, in hospital to the doctors, and it's amazing because the doctor that treated me, looked after me, um, he's an American doctor, at that time he'd been in Kenya for 28 years, I think, wow. as a doctor, and he treated three of the four presidents, mm. and he treated me. God. So God gave me the best, the best of the doctor, best. the president's physician. Yeah. I had, and I mean, I didn't. We didn't plan that. No. We didn't know that. And yes, yeah, so I'm so thankful though yeah, <laughs> because I'm here today. But you know, I met some missionaries up in Katale, mm -hmm. the trip before that one, and they became friends. And they were the ones that apparently came into the hospital when I was in Katale, sat yes. with me. They're the Brilliant. ones that contacted Ian and said, your wife is seriously yeah. ill, you have to come back. So four days later, he was on the plane coming back. And in that time, his passport had expired, so he had to get an emergency oh. one. 
he during that time. So to go back, but four days he's coming back to to Nairobi because yeah. I've gone to the capital. But I just thank God for those missionaries, those American missionaries, beautiful people, because not only did they inform Ian, see James, our home director, was was telling Ian that I wasn't well, but yeah. maybe he didn't know the extent of it or didn't want to concern him sure. too much or whatever. Um, but uh, they also on their WhatsApp had a prayer group and they got people praying probably all over the world for me. So I know through good medical treatment and prayer yes. that I'm here today to tell this miracle. story. Yeah. Yeah. What a miracle. It is a miracle, actually. And even for the home and for the children and everybody mm. involved. And well, actually for James, I think our home director is the one I felt for the most. And, and you know, I, I just went to sleep. I could have woken up in heaven. Yeah. But he was there, concerned what's going to happen to me, what happens to the the children's the home, what happens to his own livelihood with his family. Yeah. It must have been terrible. Everything for him. was at stake. Everything was at stake. So he I, I'm sure he didn't sleep very much at all. Um, but you know, he's a godly man, he would have prayed and his his mum, uh, she's she's a really godly person too, and she prayed and prayed and had a scripture that was so Timely, so um, yeah, yeah, it's an interesting time. That mm. Mm. so it was then when I came back that I, you know, I took uh, leave off the bureau for a while, yeah. and then I just decided no, it's too much. There's I've got too much work with Access Hope now, um, too much pressure with all of it. So and I started focusing was, on this. Yeah, it was time to give it up and just believe God. Yeah, and. Yeah. That's what you've been doing since. That's what I've been doing since. <laughs> so you also expanded the work in uh, Burundi. We did. We did. Um, our children's home's grown as well. And also we're now helping, we help double orphan children in our home that have yeah. no parents at all. But also we've helped um, children that can live with relatives mm -hmm. in their own home, which is great. So yeah. we help them as well. But these kids in our children's home, they'd be on the streets if they weren't oh. with us. Or well, they may not even be alive. Yeah. But yes, we did expand into Burundi. We, I was invited by the at that time the first lady of Burundi wow. to their international women's leaders conference. conference yeah. Their first one they ever had actually. Nice. And it was such an honour. She's a Christian, of course. Yes, yes. Uh, She's not the first lady now, but she, yeah. the previous one and um, lovely woman. I've met her a few times. And uh, so I was invited over to, to that and I met some amazing women, just, just ordinary women doing extraordinary things for God. Yeah. And it was so encouraging to spend time with them and to hear what they're doing and I admired them so much. And I met a Kenyan lady and she had become a missionary. She'd gone to Burundi to be a missionary. Yes. It's Burundi's near Rwanda, it's yeah. a couple countries on from Kenya. Tiny, tiny country. Tiny little heart-shaped country with about 10 million people, I think, in it. Yeah. Um, and she, Do they speak English in Burundi? They speak three languages. They speak English, French and um, uh, Swahili as well. Oh. They can speak Swahili. Yeah, they might speak others as well. Yeah. Or they have all their dialects yes. too. Wow. And I think it's French now, I'm starting to doubt myself, but I'm pretty sure. Um, anyway, I was invited to to come back and and uh, build some houses, basically, mm -hmm. for a little tribe, which is only about 1% of the population there, called the Batwa people. Yep, the Batwa. And these people... They're and, also in Rwanda, aren't they? I'm not sure about that. I think so. Oh, okay. They might be, because they were one country at one stage yeah. years ago. Um, and these Batwaka people are living in grass huts. Mm. So a grass hut can be not much bigger than what yeah. we're here. For square minutes. And, square you know, if I said to them, what happens when it rains? And they said, we just crouch down like this and they get wet. Yeah. And, of course, when you have water coming to your home and you're wet, you know, you can get sicknesses and all sorts of, of things. And it's also toxic for cooking and, yeah. you know, it's not a good environment. You might have a whole family of, you know, your whole family yes. might be in this little grass hut. 
And so I came back, I talked to our board, and we thought, okay, we'll put it out there, see what the Lord wants us to do. So we were raising money for Kenya, for the children's yeah. home, and I just put an ad out for these houses in Burundi. And that night, I got two houses oh, from hallelujah. Burundi. And that's how it started. We really yeah. don't have to push this yeah. at all. Um, and yeah, we've had to increase our cost. It was $800 then, and then it went to 1000 Now it's $1,200. But so that's a three or four roomed home. Considering yes. what it does. Yeah, so it's a three uh, roomed home. It's amazing. Long, wood with well, the what table. it is, it's mud brick, oh, mud brick. with a cement rendering. Yeah. And then it's a tin roof. Wonderful. And they feel like they're kings and queens. Yeah. So you've got a, if it's a, a family, you've got a room for your the parents, the children, kitchen and living area. Wow. And we also buy them, we might buy them some table, a table and chairs too if we have some money and that type of thing. That's beautiful. But they just, they do feel like they're kings and queens. And that, essentials. that allows our partner over there to be able to tell them about educating their girls, not yes. getting them off to be married. Yes. They share the gospel. My husband shared the gospel when we went over there too and um, we had them coming forward, taking off their witchcraft jewellery, even off a baby. Wow. And you know, just just coming to the Lord, so it's yeah. great. So I'm really hopeful I can go it's, back. The year. oppression is is because of the spiritual first of all, mm. and then the poverty that comes mm. with it. Mm. It's sad. It is sad. Yeah. However, you are bringing hope. We're bringing hope, and I'm very pleased to be working with Jane and her team over there. They're doing a great job. It's so important that when you work in a developing country, that you have somebody that's it's always godly. Cool and honest yeah whom do you do it that's right and, uh, and we've look, got the right we, person we get involved in a number of nations with missions but i mm -hmm. generally only get involved if i have been there mm -hmm. myself and i know who i partner with yes that's right and also so, too it's sensible to get receipts and yeah you know things like that be accountability yeah and yeah. it's good for the people here for the support mm -hmm. that you receive here mm -hmm. Uh, even now, real. like we, we just sent some money into Romania for the Ukrainian refugees. Yes. And I was humbled by the generosity of the people here. Mm -hmm. um, especially when you have a specific project and you know that the money is going there 100%. Mm -hmm. It's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I, I love to, to see how people are connecting with the mission work. It's beautiful. Yes, it is. It's great. So you're uh, in the season of life. You are focusing on Access Hope Inc. Yes. And you're working pretty much every day in that, to some capacity. I am, um, yeah, all yeah, the time. <laughs> you were looking for somebody to come in and give you some. I help. am. I've got to the stage now that I need a PA. I okay. need someone to assist me. Yeah. Um, someone that has those skills. Have you found that person? No. Are you out there? Yeah. <laughs> So he yeah. does looking for somebody a couple of days a week, two, three days a week to help with admin work. Mm. So if you have it on your heart, um, you can, can they work remotely or do they need to be with you? Well, both? I think probably a mix actually. And you're in Jane Brook? In, in Jane Brook, yeah, yes. Yeah, Australia? Yes. And Access Hope, mm -hmm. it supports the um, children's home in Kenya. Yes. The building of the homes in Burundi. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yes, the children add? living in the community. And okay. also a few years ago, we set up a training program in a prison in Kenya. Oh. And administration and computer skills. You'd like that IT. If you come Beautiful. over, you can give them <laughs> the tips. Um, and we started it. We had our first graduating students. It was amazing. The whole prison just shuts down. It's a big celebration. Yes. And uh, was wonderful actually. Even one guy who had left the prison yeah. came back. Yeah. I think he's very brave. Came back into the prison yeah. just for that time, that graduation um, ceremony. Yes. And then COVID hit, oh. and the prison was shut down for a long time. And but we just started again just last month. We've got that started again as not at another prison a bit closer to us, so we yeah. don't have those transport costs. So that's what we do as well. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And it's we're also looking for a treasurer. My husband said, please tell them we need a treasurer oh, okay. for our board. So. There you go. Mm. Mm. Well, all of these, uh, God has provided until now, and He will provide for the he future. He will, I'm sure. What do you see yourself doing in the next decade? Um. Okay, probably more access home. <laughs> more mission, more ministry. More, yes. So mission is not something that you do, mission is... Who you are. 
Yeah, well, my husband says I'll never retire. Yeah. And, you know, the best life is when we're serving the Lord, isn't it? Of course. Seriously. What else would we want to be doing? Yeah. I mean, there's nothing better. Yes. And um, missions charges me. It just inspires me. And, yeah, it's great. Um, I just, I'm so thankful to God that when he called me, as we found, you found out today, I was just an ordinary mum in Geraldton, a country town in Western Australia with yeah. two little girls, and you know, and yet he called me yeah. for, to be able to do this ministry, and yeah. I'm just ever so thankful. I just, I love it. Yeah. And I think this call is for many others, but they're just afraid to step. Yes. I think that taking that first step is mm. uh, is difficult. I always say to people, every Christian should go into cross-cultural missions at least once in their lifetime. Mm. And every pastor or church leader should go into cross-cultural missions mm. at least once a year. Mm. Because when we do that, we will pray for missions, we will support missions, yes. and our heart will be connected with the trenches mm. where the real work is. Mm. I think, you know, we've just got to take that first step. Yeah. And if we make a mistake, we make a mistake, but at least we've tried. Yeah, oh, I've you know? made many mistakes, mm. especially in partnership and missions, mm. but uh, I don't regret them mm. because God was glorified in what we did, mm. even though we, were, we weren't that fantastic. <laughs> What's the legacy you'd like to pass on to generations that follow? Oh, oh wow. Um, the legacy I'd like to leave is that the children that I've been able to reach and help, yes. that they have a strong Christian um, principles and morals and ethics as they grow, yeah. and that they get good jobs, they're able to give back to their communities, yes. and I suppose they're able to pass it forward, as we say, and you know help others. Yeah. Um, if I achieve that, which I'm believing God I will, you know, with those that we've helped in our children's home, the CBC, even those we've reached out in the prison in Burundi, yes. um, help change their lives for the better, well then, I think my life is counted for something. Yeah. Are you training somebody at the moment? Are you discipling somebody? That's something I want to do. Mm. Um, and that's something I'm thinking that, you know, with the PA, maybe, They've got a, well, I'm oh. hoping they have a heart for missions. Yeah. You'd have to, actually, if you work with me for this job, um, that they might end up, you know, taking a lot of that from me. And who knows? You know, it's always an issue, isn't it, for pastors and leaders yeah. about this. But I had to resolve myself to, you know, this is God's ministry. Yes. So when it's the right time, he'll bring the right person along. Yeah. But, yes, I think we're always conscious of that. Good. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, Linda, you've inspired me tonight. I'm sure you've inspired our listeners and those people who watch. Thank you so much for answering God's call on your life and going out there and doing it. I just hope that with the borders opening, you get a chance to go back to Africa soon. Yes, thank you. I'm sure you can't wait to get on that plane. I can't wait. (laughs) To to Qatar or to uh, uh, Dubai and just fly back into Nairobi and Mm. see it happening. Thank so, you so much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's been great. And for those people who want to find out more, they find you on our website, which is um, accesshope.org.au. So accesshope.org.au. Mm-hmm. And we've also got our Facebook and Instagram. As you do. As you do. <laughs> Access Hope. Yeah. Well, friends, what an amazing journey, what an amazing life at the feet of Jesus, serving in ministry and in missions, both here and internationally. Um, you may think that this is not for everybody, but I'm sure Linda thought that too for many years. However, God, something, God had something else for her, and this has matured and has seasoned in her life, and at the moment, the ripple effect is massive in Africa, both in Kenya and Burundi. Well, first of all, you can support Access Hope and Linda, but I want you to go one step further to find the call of God on your life, and especially if you have a call for missions to take that first step and not hold back. Because the uh, field, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So just become a laborer in the Lord's harvest and go and see what God can do with you. And begin a new legacy for you and for those who follow you. And may the Lord help you.
Uh, please share this content with others. Give us five stars on um, Apple Podcasts if you are listening on that platform. If you're on YouTube, just like it and share it with other people so others can subscribe to our channel. And uh, yeah, come back next week as we bring you more wonderful stories from Perth, Western Australia, from Kingdom Stories from Down Under. Um, I am Nathaniel Costia. Thank you for joining us on Kingdom Stories from Down Under. We'd love it if you would subscribe, rate, and share these stories with your wider community. And remember, every story is worth sharing, including yours.